No, NFTs are not crypto. It's part of crypto. Yes and no. Yes, it is. NFT run on a crypto platform. Uh, they work on the same technology. I don't think so. Uh, oh, no, they're not. It's good. I understand. Okay, <laughs> that's a good benchmark. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Shikai, General Partner and COO at Longhash Ventures, where we invest in Web3 startups and infrastructure. And this is the second episode of NFT for You. Now, previously, we talked about why people are going crazy over NFTs. And today, we're going to go a bit deeper into the technology that's underlying NFTs. And the reason why I do that is, you might be wondering how are NFTs different from let's say an item that I get in the game because I beat the game or I bought it in game, or you might be thinking, how is it different from the rights I get? Let's say when I join a group on social media. Now, the magic lies in the underlying tech, which we will call public open blockchains. If you have never heard of blockchain before, here's how you can think about it in a very simple way. Imagine there's a book of records of what everybody owns or what everybody is doing and instead of it being stored or recorded by one particular company, which is how it's being done on the internet today, pretty scary, it's being maintained by thousands of people all over the internet and they don't need to trust each other, they don't need to know each other, but we all collectively secure this like public book of records. If you already know uh, what blockchain is, then you might be familiar with some of the functionalities that it might have. The most exciting one by far is what we call smart contracts. Smart contracts automate and standardize the interactions that you can have on a blockchain. So for example, if I want to buy or sell an NFT against a particular person, like I know that if I give you this NFT, you're going to pay me and you can't just like run away with my NFT or, or the reverse way, you can't just like run away with my money. On a high level, once we think about blockchains in a more complex way, the main feature that I'm really excited about is called composability. Because all of the assets and all of the smart contracts are publicly available, you can then look at what is possible and start to piece them together kind of like Lego bricks. And you can build complex interactions and even businesses on top of that. You can provide new perks and utility or rights to existing holders in a completely permissionless way. You don't need to ask for their permission. Oh, can I integrate with you? Or can we like open up this API? All you need to do is call that smart contract or target those particular assets. There's so much more that we can talk about. There are new blockchains that are, for example, faster, like more secure, have like faster finality. We can talk about scaling into layer twos or like app specific chains or like function specific chains that are dedicated to storage or modular chains like those that are for, for example, data availability. So. If you'd like to find out more, please tell us what you'd like to learn by commenting below. And remember to like, share, subscribe, and hit that bell button so you will know when the content comes out first. I would say that NFTs should and can only exist on blockchains, and they should not exist in private companies' databases. Why is it problematic, you might ask? Well, today, your social media companies and your search companies actually they are the ones that are responsible for what data exists on the platform. They are responsible for what data is shown to you. So in a way, they're responsible for the like entire digital world. Right? Like how can they know possibly what to censor and what, what is like too much violence, what is like politically incorrect? When you have a party that's forced to make decisions, there is no perfect party that can make all the perfect decisions all the time. So the alternative is to have a platform that's what we call credibly neutral. That means that it cannot make any value judgments. It cannot stop anybody from doing anything. But what it also means is that now you have ownership over the contracts. You have ownership over the assets. The blockchain cannot stop you from issuing assets. The blockchain cannot stop you from interacting with other assets or other people in any way that you like. But it means that you are responsible for checking that Actually, this is the asset that you want. These are the people that you want to interact with. This is the way that you want to interact with them through these particular pieces of code. So when you have that, now I can build a lot more useful applications on top. And the reason I can do that is because 
Now, I'm more secure that like something that exists today won't randomly disappear tomorrow. I know that once it's on the blockchain, it's what we call real because it's permanent due to the immutability. That means that the records are not deletable on the blockchain. When I have that security, then I can say, hey, look, let me build a business on top of this smart contract. Let me offer a business that targets these NFTs because I know they will continue to be there. And like they allow for public innovation. For example, you might be issuing your NFTs. I might see, hey, you're part of this really cool club. And I want to invite anybody who owns the NFTs of your club to come to my party. And yeah, you know, this open innovation is allowed. Uh, unlike the private companies databases where like you actually have to ask for permission or they have to specifically open up these permissions for you to do things. It's truly a digital world where you can do whatever you want. When we talk about public blockchains, because of the nature of it, that's like, remember I said there's like a book that anybody can keep track of, anybody can help maintain. How do you ensure that these people are not fake, are not having malicious intent? You need some way to verify that they're doing proper work. So you do that by introducing certain barriers of entry and you have to reward them for doing the work correctly of maintaining this like open ledger. So how that's done for all the public blockchains is to issue a native cryptocurrency, right? And this forms the native asset on each of these blockchains. This means that any of the assets that are built on top are also easily interoperating with that native digital asset. For example, if I want to buy an NFT today on Ethereum, most probably I'm going to be using ETH or ETH, the cryptocurrency that is natively generated by the blockchain. So how would you use these and how is it linked to NFTs? So today, if you want to buy NFTs, you will most probably transact in the native currency ETH or ETH. And if you want to mint an NFT in order to create that contract, you will need to pay for the work that's being done by the blockchain in the native asset that is ETH. In fact, any of the transactions on the blockchain will be paid in this native currency because you, it is needed to secure the underlying infrastructure. Just to wrap up, today we talked about what gives NFTs their magic and it's the underlying technology blockchain. And blockchains, as you recall, are credibly neutral platforms that you know will be there and therefore the assets can be real. And that also means you can innovate on top what we call composability. And because it's neutral and composable. How it's done is that it's secured by random people all over the internet. And because of that, you need cryptocurrency to be natively created. And therefore, cryptocurrency is also the native asset that's being used anytime you do anything on these blockchains. So that's all for today. Please comment down below what you've learned from today's episode, and we'll see you next time.